This is a recording of Nectar in a Sieve by Kamala Markandeya. Chapter 22 Selvam and Ira had always been close. The years of separation when my daughter went to her husband, having affected their relationship not at all, she treated him more as if he were her son than her brother and he in turn accepted her love and returned it in his own deep, quiet way. He understood her well, better than I, who was her mother, in fact. I wonder whether parents ever know their children as they know one another. At any rate, in our family, my sons and daughter had always been as one in their thinking. Such schism as there was opened between them and us, never between themselves. Callie said this was so because they were better read, more learned than we were, ever since the troubles at the tannery in which her sons had become involved, and for other reasons she had been prejudiced against any kind of learning. In her view, most of the troubles in the country sprang from the pages of books. Selvam's easy attitude towards her son brought Ira even closer to him. From the beginning, Selvam had accepted the child's albinism, accepted it and thought no more of it. From infancy, he treated Sacrabani exactly as if he were a normal child. The pity of it was that it was a forlorn battle. No amount of such action on his part or ours could bring others to the same persuasion. Sacrabani was isolated from the start. A white crow in a flock of black, a grain of wheat among the rice. By the time he was four, Sacrabani was used to being a hanger-on, forever on the fringes of others' activities. Because of his difference, the other children never included him as a matter of course in their games. If they were short of a player or for some other good reason, they sometimes invited him to join them. But on no account was he to do so of his own accord. In the hope of being thus asked, he had to tag along, patient and submissive. His physical disabilities alone would have ensured his dependent role, for his skin was unable to stand the sun, and the light affected his eyes. The sight of him, crouched in the shade with reddened face and streaming eyes, evoked from his companions not pity, but ribaldry. Poor child, he even had to suffer the behavior of his elders, who stared, those who had not seen him before, and nudged each other and whispered and rustled, while those who had vied with each other to be the first to enlighten them. Then one day, sprung from who knows what taunts flung at him, his questionings, first of many, began. Mother, what is a blank? What does one say to a child? What possible answer is there? I saw Ira eyeing the boy, startled, wary, trying to guess how much innocence and how much knowledge lay behind the question, wondering how little and how much she could tell him, questioning in her turn to gain time. Why do you ask? I want to know. It is a child whose birth his mother did not wish for. Oh, he said, looking at her speculatively. Did you wish me to be born? Yes, of course, darling. Ira cried in all the guilt of her efforts to have an abortion was in her voice. I would not lose you for anything. Why do you have to ask? I wanted to know, he repeated lightly, non-committally, not knowing how cruelly he had hurt his mother. Some days later, he tackled her again. Mother? Have I got a father? Yes, dear, of course. Where is he? Not here, my son. He is away. Why does he never come to see us? He will when he can. But why not now? Because he cannot. You will understand when you are older. How old? 
I do not know myself. Now run away and play. You must not ask so many questions. The first lie, many to follow. The distressing, inescapable need for lying. I would have told him his father was dead, I said, as he certainly is to all intents and purposes. It would have been easier. Not, do not interfere, Nathan said. It is for Ira to decide. Ira looked heavy-eyed and hurt. Yes, you are right, she said. I should have told him that. I was not prepared for the question. He is such a baby still. He did not think of it himself, I said. He is as yet too young. No doubt one of his companions. Leave it. Leave it, said Nathan. Do not upset the girl any more. He put out his hand to Ira, but she shied away from him. I saw her leave the hut. It is no use going to her, Nathan said sadly. Such comfort as there is to be had must come from her own spirit. Nevertheless, after a little while he did go to her, and his gentleness melted her last remnants of control, for she began to weep. I heard her crying for a long time.